our confession together. I am a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. I hope you are. We're going we're gonna to wrap up Father Abraham today. And uh, we're going to study about him, not from the Old Testament book of Genesis, but from the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the faith chapter. Read with me or, or follow along as I read to you, please. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their father, for he has prepared a city for them. And by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. An amazing statement. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. May God bless us in reading this amazing passage in his church said. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a seat, kids. Got your lesson ready for you. Hope you guys enjoy that. Ah, uh, we come to the end. You know, anytime we finish a series, I think most of you know I like to preach in series a lot. There's always a certain sadness in leaving, and there's also a certain tremendous joy in that you now get to move to something new. Oh, yes, I have a new series in mind. I'm going to talk to you in the next several weeks about getting through tough times, how to get through tough times. We're going to look at some amazing passages. But I don't find many more amazing than this exit or this uh, Hebrews 11 passage. That that whole chapter, by the way, is just a real inspiration. Every verse of Hebrews 11 is just it's just one amazing statement after another. As the writer of Hebrews parades the great Old Testament men and women of faith in front of his readers, in the hopes that they will be inspired by the examples of the past. And nowhere is that truer than of Abraham. Abraham literally straddles the Bible from the Old to the New Testament in a way that nobody else does. David, for all of his greatness, does not stand astride the Scriptures the way Abraham does. In fact, Abraham is the father of three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and would you believe Islam? The Islamic faith recognizes Abraham as the first great father and through Ishmael, the father of all the Arab nations, something we noticed several weeks back when we looked at the birth of Ishmael. And so we find in Abraham a rather amazing person. Over the last several weeks, we've watched him go from, as, as a young man from his home in Ur of the Chaldees north and west up into the headwaters of the Tigris River to Haran, where his father Terah died. We've watched him travel south with his, with his possessions and his family into the land of Canaan. We've watched him visit places like Hebron, Beersheba, the land, the area of the Philistines, the area where the Hittites lived. 
We've watched him witness the destruction, the devastation of Sodom and Gomorrah. We've watched him fight kings to free his nephew Lot after he was taken a hostage by those kings. We've watched him travel to Egypt and almost lose his wife through a lie to come back home and tell the same lie again and almost again lose his wife. We've watched him try to assist God in his promises by birthing a son that God never intended him to have, a son that later became the father of the Arab nations and a, a tremendous antagonist to the descendants of Abraham. We've watched him and Sarah in their old age receive that little child of promise when they were 90, 100 years old. An amazing, amazing birth outside of the birth of Jesus, perhaps the most remarkable birth in the Bible. Only to see God ask for the life of that child when he was about 15. We've seen Abraham's faith operate again and again and again and again, even amidst all of his flaws. We've seen God work through him to build a great nation, to build a great heritage, to build a place in the land of Canaan. And now we notice last week he came to the point where his dear wife of 112 years, Sarah, passed away, and he finally bought land in Canaan and established a physical presence in the land of promise and then lived on several years after that. And at the age of 175, it said he lived a full life and died kind of kind of on the upside. He was, he was holding the championship trophy when he died. Lived a long and prosperous life. Let's look back at his life and see what we can learn from him. First of all, like I mentioned, after his death, Abraham becomes the father of the Jews. He becomes, he's the one that established circumcision as the mark of the covenant. He's the one through whom God made the covenant that was fulfilled by the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. He was the father of that generation that came out of Egypt in that his grandson, Jacob, moved with his boys down to Egypt, spent 400 years there, grew into a massive population of people, and then came back after 40 years in the wilderness to enter the promised land as the Israelites, but they could have more easily been called the Abrahamites because he was the founding father of that whole nation. God said he would make of him a nation that numbered like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, and indeed he did. In fact, Abraham's descendants in one form or another still live on the earth today, all over the face of the earth. And so what a remarkable thing. You know, there are more Jews today in New York City than there are in Israel. They are all over the world, literally. And so his heritage has been a remarkable one. After the cross, Abraham got co-opted. He got picked up by Christian writers and preachers, and he became something even far greater as he became the father of those who put their faith in Christ. He was such an outstanding example of faith, and there were many examples of faith in the Bible. Read Hebrews 11. There's a lot of them. But only Abraham gets three paragraphs. Only Abraham is described as the real father of the faithful. A man, in fact, the writer of Hebrews is not the only person to use Abraham. Paul uses him frequently in his illustrations of Paul's writings. But um, I want you to think about this passage, and let me get it around. I've got big print where I can see it. Isn't that nice? When you get old, you become a great-grandfather. You have to have big letters. Just the way it works. I want you to look at this passage in Romans 4 where Paul describes Abraham's meaning to us as Christians. It's an amazing passage. He says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. 
That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. You get that connection there? He says, Abraham was as good as dead when God raised up a child in his life. And as surely as God did that because God could do it. God through Christ and his blood on the cross has chosen to bring us back from death as good as dead. And give us life in Christ. And because of Abraham's faith in God and his un unfailing trust in God. God considered him righteous in right standing. And he says the same can be true of us if we have the same faith in God. What a great example. And that could be multiplied a dozen times in the New Testament. But our best summary is in the book of Hebrews. No question about it. Love the book of Hebrews. It's got a lot of neat stuff in it. But this 11th chapter just stands out apart from Virtually every chapter in the Bible. You know, you got certain chapters. You got the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Psalm 23, the great praise to the Word of God, in Psalm 119. You know, you got certain chapters that just kind of jump out, slap you in the face, and jump all over you. Hebrews 11 is one of those. It just shouts out, hey, you got to look at me more closely. There's just so many good things here. I'd like us to look at these few verses that we've pointed out. And just see uh, uh, three basic things that we can learn about this man's life that I think need to be implied in our lives as well. Because we need to have, the, I mean, we've already been told if we have the same faith as Abraham, then God's going to declare us righteous. God's going to be pleased with us just as he was with Abraham. So first of all, when called by God, Abraham followed. And that reminds me of the fact that what does Jesus say? If any man would be my disciple... Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So just as God has called Abraham to walk into unknown territory, when we become, hey, anybody who's been a Christian very long knows when you become a Christian, follow Jesus, you're walking into a lot of unknowns. You're walking into a lot of unknown territory. And you just, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge, just like it was for Abraham. And so what a great passage. Again, I remind you of the verses. He says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Don't we, don't we like certainty? We love it when we can lay out our plan. I, I, have, a, I have a daughter. I love my daughter to death. I, you all have heard this before, but i got to tell you again. When we go on vacation, my daughter hands out an itinerary for everybody. She has an itinerary. We get up at, at 7.03. We have breakfast at 7.24. We wash the dishes at 7.46. We get in the car at 8.03. Uh, you know, and, and here we go. And it's like, what was it? What was it? Jimmy Buffett once said, I don't need that much organization in my life. I, I like Jimmy more and more as I get older. He says, I don't need that much organization in my life. And, uh, but we like organization, don't we? We like to feel like we know exactly where everything's going. It's going to all happen the way we want. And when it gets disrupted, boy, it just tears us up. God told Abraham, he says, I want you to go. Abraham says, fine, where are we going? Can't tell you. How long is it going to take? Can't tell you. When am I going to get there? Can't tell you. What's it going to be like? Won't tell you. He just said, pack it up, move, son. And you know, when you become a Christian, life's a lot that way. You don't know what God's going to throw at you. You don't know what life's going to throw at you. Just when you think you got it all figured out, you realize you don't have any of it figured out. Life just threw everything right in your face. And you, but, but with God as your anchor and with faith in God as your starting point, you can get through that and really make good things happen out of your life. And that's what Abraham does. He says, by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Lived in tents who, uh, with, with Isaac and Jacob who were heirs of the same promise. He was looking forward to a city with foundation. Cities with foundations back then weren't very frequent. You know, well, he's talking about cities that had walls. If you know anything about the ancient world, there are very few cities back then. I mean like, like formal, laid out, large 
population areas that had walls and foundations and little houses inside. Very rare. Very rare. Even when you had them, the cities were usually fortresses inhabited by the rulers and their families, and then everybody else lived outside the gates in whatever they could find. And when the enemy attacked, what would they do? All the people outside would run inside, shut the door. And then when the enemy left, they'd open the door and everybody would go back out. So even back then, even though you may live next to a city with foundations, most people didn't have that kind of certainty and, and stability in their lives. And Abraham, of course, and his family lived in tents all their lives. This man lived 175 years in tents. This guy was like on an eternal camping trip. Imagine that. But imagine moving your whole household from place to place, day to day, year to year, season to season, for 175 years in tents. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? For us in our day and time, the goal of every young couple is to what? Get a house, a city with foundations. Although God's not the builder and maker usually. So that's kind of the idea. Abraham left his home and his kinsmen. The only person he took with him when he left was Lot. And Lot, carrying Lot along was like pulling a lead weight. That boy didn't get it. Lot never contributed anything that we can tell in a positive way to Abraham's life. All he was, from the day they left Ur of the Chaldees, from the day they left Haran, from the day they entered the land of Canaan, Lot was nothing but a liability. Always arguing, always fighting, always disputes over the flocks, disputes over the, over the wells. Where are you going to live? Who gets the best pasture? Okay, I'll go live down towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Dumb decision. Sodom and Gomorrah get ransacked by the kings. Lot gets taken captive. They head off to the north. Who has to go bail him out? Abraham gathers a military force, goes and frees him, brings him back, gets right back into the filth and muck of the pigsty that was Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham then tries to rescue him by bargaining with God. That doesn't amount to anything finally has to stand back and watch the annihilation of those cities. Only to find out that his son Lot survived and ended up being deceived and impregnated by his own daughters, or impregnating his own daughters. Uh, uh, this guy's just, he's just a train wreck. He's, everything about him is a train wreck. And yet, Abraham sticks with him. But he leaves everybody else. Now, in a, in a world where tribal connections and clan connections are everything, that is a massive requirement. What does Jesus say to us? That, if you, that you cannot love your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters, your wife, your children more than you love him. He has to come first. Period. End of discussion. Abraham learned that the hard way. You notice when he wanted a wife for his own son, he had to send back up to Haran to get a girl from the clan because there wasn't anybody around. That's how isolated he was. You ever feel isolated as a Christian, trying to live the Christian life? Yeah, it's, it's part of walking with God because when you live your life as a stranger and a sojourner, that's the way it works, a stranger and an alien. What's an alien? Somebody from outside coming in, you know, we worry so much about people's, people's uh, 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 heritage in our country nowadays. I'd love for everybody in the, in the White House to have a DNA analysis, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that be fascinating? Everybody in Congress have a DNA analysis and find out where they really came from. We might have some hooping and hollering going on. Yeah. We all come from somewhere. Ain't none of us grew up. None of, none of, us, none of us go back 40 generations here. You know, and as Christians, we don't go back any generations at all. When you become a Christian, you become a part of a family that has no earthly heritage. This is not our world. Paul reminds the Corinthian or reminds the Philippian Christians, and by the way, Philippi is a Roman city founded by retired soldiers from the battle between Augustus and Mark Antony. And Brutus and Cassius, 
when, when Julius Caesar was assassinated. Augustus, at that time called Octavian, Octavian and Mark Anthony decided to seek vengeance against the killers. And so they met in battle outside Philippi. They both gathered massive armies. Uh, Octavian and Anthony win a resounding victory. And in reward to their soldiers for what they did, they settled them in the city of Philippi. And it became a Roman Citizen, nothing greater in the first century world than to be a Roman citizen. What does Paul say to the Roman citizens at Philippi? Our citizenship is in heaven. I mean, he just spits right in the eye of the Roman Empire. He says, hey, we're not Roman citizens. We're Christians. We're our, our citizenship, we belong in heaven. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter that, that we are strangers in this world, that we're just passing through. And that's why another thing I like about Abraham is he learned to travel light. He learned, to, and, and that's so important. How often does the Bible, Jesus tells the story of the, of the seed that's sown, the parable of the sower. We had it in our Bible school, right? In our vacation Bible school, parable of the sower. Even the kids in here could tell me this. You had the, the, the soil, that, the, the seed that fell on good soil and produced. You had the seed that fell on the rock, didn't go anywhere, on the pavement, didn't go anywhere. You had the 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 stuff that the seed that fell on the thin soil wasn't enough to sustain it but what was the fourth one the seed that fell among thorns and got choked out and Jesus says that the thorns represent the cares of this life you know what that means the baggage the more you get the more you get weighed down by stuff in this world stuff what people think of you, your standing, your reputation, whether people like you. The more you take on that kind of stuff, the heavier the load gets. And you know, one of the things you notice when an army is fleeing is they dump everything they don't need. You know, you can always tell when an army's been routed because you can follow the trail of all the equipment they leave on the side of the road. Because when you're running for your life and you're trying to survive, you can't afford to carry, you know, a big 60-pound machine gun with 21 belts of ammunition. It's nice to have, but when you're running for your life, it becomes a liability. A lot of things in this life become liabilities when you try to live the Christian life, and you need to unload. We all need to unload a lot. And one of the things about Abraham, it mentions he lived in tents. It mentioned he went from place to place. He learned to travel light because you never know when God's going to look at you and say, hey, we're moving. Remember the children of Israel in the wilderness? Two million people. They'd get up one morning, God would say, they'd look up and they'd say, where's the cloud? Oh, it's taking off down the road. Oh, man, we got to pack. They got to pack everything up and get all ready. Follow the follow the cloud down the road and it would go until the cloud stopped and then they'd set up oh we finally got the camp cloud might take off next morning you learn to travel light don't you never know where god's going to take you when promised a child abraham waited oh did he wait he waited and he waited and he waited beyond reason are you waiting on god to do something in your life is there something that you have taken to God and you just keep waiting and you keep saying well come on now when's it going to happen is it going to happen and you know after a while you start questioning don't you I mean it's easy to especially in our instant oatmeal age you know we want it yesterday and we want it served in three minutes hot you know with a drink on the side and uh you know, life just doesn't work that way. And God doesn't work that way. God doesn't get in a hurry to get things done. Uh, I'm not going to read through this whole passage, but it talks about Sarah being past childbearing age. And yet he says in verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died, even though they didn't receive everything they were promised. When Abraham and Sarah died... They had Isaac, the son, but what had God promised through Isaac? Generations, right? Do you know that while the servant of Abraham was on his way to Haran to get a wife for Isaac, Abraham died? When he got back home, Abraham was dead. Abraham, 34 years earlier, had already buried Sarah. 
they neither one even lived. It, they, they took them forever to have the kid. And once they had the kid, they neither one lived to even see him get married, much less have descendants. And yet, look what God did with it. They died not receiving the promises. All Abraham owned. God said to Abraham, I'll give you this whole land, the land of Canaan. It was almost 600 years before the children of Israel captured the land of Canaan. In fact, they spent 400 of those years, hundreds of miles away, captive, captive in Egypt. But God doesn't forget his promises. He just doesn't get in a hurry. And we need to remember that. He and Sarah received this promised child in their old age. He was 100, she was 90. Uh, what does Paul say in Romans 4? As good as dead? I would hate for somebody to say that about me. Wouldn't you hate for somebody to look and say, I dug down, boy, he's good as dead. <laughs> look at him. I mean, you can tell by looking, he ain't got long in his life. You know, you just don't want people to think that about you. He says, Abraham, when they received Isaac as their child, Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead. I guess as far as childbearing, at least, that would have been true, wouldn't it? For Abraham and Sarah, from them, God raised up a nation. Now, they didn't see that. Like I said, they never lived to see that. But when Abraham's descendants went into Egypt under Jacob, the Bible says there were 70 of them. We don't know the total number that came back, but scholars estimate it could be as high as a million and a half to two million of them. Can you imagine as you stand on top of the walls of Jericho and the children of Israel are massed, two million of them, across the Jordan River, it's in flood stage, the Jordan River, the, the people are over there, two million of them, and you're sitting there saying, well, that's no problem, we got big walls and the river's flooding. The Bible says that that afternoon, God dammed the river at the city of Adam and dried up 70 miles of the Jordan River. Now, why would God have to dry up 70 miles? Because it took that much room for all of them to get across the river. Can you imagine the people on the walls at Jericho watching this? Exodus into their land over dry land that God had miraculously provided and thinking, oh, this does not look good. This does not look good for us. I don't like what I'm seeing. And that's what's going, that's just, just what God's capable of doing. So mighty nation. The, the thing is, they sought something greater. And, and what I call this is big picture thinking. Christians are people that have to learn to see the big picture. What's going on with me right now isn't necessarily the big picture. It's just one little piece of the puzzle. Do you ever, any of you like to work puzzles? Drive you crazy, don't they? Drive you crazy to try to work puzzles. I love to work puzzles. You try to figure them out, and each piece makes a contribution. But sometimes you really don't see much for a long time because it takes a long time to get enough pieces in one area so that you begin to say, oh, that's one of those beach umbrellas, okay. And this over here is a boat in the water. Oh, I wonder what the rest of it is. And you keep going and you keep going. And then you get almost to the end and you can't find that one piece. And it's the one that you've come back to 175 times over the last three weeks. Every time you start the puzzle, the first piece you look for is that one you couldn't find. And then you realize at the very end of the whole thing, it was on the floor under the rug and you didn't know it was there. You know, life's a lot that way. Sometimes it's, it's you know, what gets us about life's the missing pieces. Pieces we can't find or we can't make them fit. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to make a piece fit that really doesn't go there? It will go there, you know, and you think to yourself, I'm going to get some scissors out. I'll make this thing fit. This piece will fit. Even though it's green and the background's red, I'm going to make it fit because I'm, I'm tired of looking for the right piece. We do that. Abraham tried that. Sarah tried that. Becomes a problem. When asked for his son, Abraham obeyed. 
No questions asked. And I think the most amazing statement in all of this is that last statement in verse 19. Let me get it up for you. Look at that last statement in verse 19. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Now, why would he think that? Well, God had already told him, Isaac's going to be the son of promise. The promise is going to go through Isaac. He's going to bring the generations. He's going to bring the blessings. He's going to have the descendants. And then God says to him, but before we do all that, I want you to kill him. And Abraham's like, uh, okay. Um, so what's the big plan here? But see how Abraham keeps the big plan in mind? The big plan is God is going to bring generations from Isaac. That's the big plan. The small stuff is God wants him dead right now. So Abraham has to get to thinking. Now, Abraham's not a theologian. Abraham doesn't have a degree from Yale University in Old Testament theology. In fact, the concept of resurrection is only mentioned, would you believe, one time in the Old Testament, and that's in Daniel 12. The only time the concept of raising somebody from the dead as an act of God is mentioned. One time. And yet, here's Father Abraham. He's sitting there. He's looking at his son tied up on the altar. He's got the, got the knife in his hand, and he's thinking, well, I'm going to go through with this. If God says <coughs> I'm going to be blessed through him, he'll give him back to me. If he takes him away, he'll give him back. I don't know how he'll give him back, but I know he'll give him back. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's some bodacious faith right there. That is some seriously bodacious faith. You talk about reaching, that is about as reaching as you're going to get. But he says to, my, to himself, I, I've never heard of this idea of raising somebody from the dead, but God's going to have to do that if I sacrifice him. God's the only way he's going to carry out the promise. And maybe it was that assurance that made it easier for him to go through with it. He was willing to give God anything he wanted. When you're willing to give God your only child, you're willing to give him anything he asked for. What's God ask you for? What's your Isaac? What's God ask you to give up? A habit? A relationship? A job? A cherished belief? Relationships with family that maybe aren't going to go so well if you're a Christian? What's God ask of you? And is it in any sense more than what God asked of Abraham? And yet Abraham trusted in God. His faith in God led him to thoughts of resurrection. It's amazing what faith in God will drive you to. <laughs> if you believe in God enough, it'll just take you all kinds of places you never thought you could go. God will, God will push you outside of your box real fast and make you trust him. And the last thing is <coughs> he refused to question the wisdom of God's will. He never one time, if you look at the story, he never one time looked at God and said, are you sure this is what you want me to do? He never looked at God and said, well, how am I going to have children through him if he dies? He never looked at God and said, but I thought you were a God who didn't believe in human sacrifice. In fact, when Isaac looks at him and says, Father, where is the ram for the sacrifice? What does Abraham say? God will provide. That's faith. That's faith. You ever been at a place in your life where you didn't know how it was going to work out, but you knew God would provide? Sometimes you just have to hang on to that. It's the only thing that gets you through. It's the only thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. God will get me through this. God will work it out. God will provide. What a great statement of faith. So let me ask you two closing questions real quick. These aren't real. Well, they are real challenging. I want you to think about this. How deeply do you trust in the will of God? Do you really believe that, that you should do what God's will says in whatever area it is, whether it's in your worship, whether it's in your moral life, whether it's in your business choices, your language, your habits, your choice of companionship, whatever it is. Do you really trust in the will of God? I mean, absolutely, unquestionably, unhesitatingly trust in the will of God. God says to Abraham, 
pack up and move, and he packed up and moved. God said, give me your son, and he gave him his son. He says, go here, he goes here. He says, do that, he does that. That's unquestioning. The Bible says when Jesus said to his disciples, drop your nets and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, it says they dropped their nets. I love Mark's word because this is one of Mark's favorite words in the gospel of Mark, euthus in Greek, immediately they dropped their nets. They didn't even finish emptying them or hang them out to dry. They just dropped them where they were. Somebody else found them and used them. That didn't matter. They weren't going to be doing that anymore anyway immediately do you have that kind of trust in the will of God and finally how faithfully do you live in the promises of God God says that if you're willing to die for him he'll give you a crown of life he says if you're faithful he'll give you a pillar in the temple of God in heaven he says if you're faithful to him until the day you die you'll get a crown of life he says there's no temptation you'll ever face that he won't see you through. God says that everything in your life will work to the good of your salvation. Do you believe those promises? Jesus says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. You believe that with all your heart? Are you willing to do it based on the fact that you believe it with all your heart? You know, most of you know when I baptize somebody, I ask them two questions, don't I? One of them is, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And the other one is, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Because if you don't believe those, you're wasting our time. And we're wasting yours. You got to buy in, man. You got to buy in. 100%. You got to buy in. It's just like a coach with a team. Hey, this is our new offensive system. You either buy in, or I'll give you a list of good schools that would be able to use your talents besides us because you're not going to fit in here. From the beginning of the coming of Christ until the end of the age, if you're going to become a Christian, you got to buy in. If you're not a Christian, let's buy in. Let's become a Christian this morning. Let me or somebody know. You can come forward and let us know. We'll baptize you into Christ. That's not the end of the whole show. That's the beginning. But it's the, it's the most essential first step you can make because you make your faith real when you make that public commitment to Jesus. If you're a Christian, you're not where you should be. Let's get on board. You know, God always gives you a way home. He always says, pick it up and go on. I'm right there beside you. No matter how prodigal you may be, Daddy's always on the front porch waiting for you to come back. Whatever your need is, we love you enough. Learn a lesson from Father Abraham. Come to him while we stand and sing.